he tells me, um, we can't hear you. Um, there's one, I have this little sign here, a host disabled participant screen sharing. So um, perhaps um, I'll just, somebody uh, help me doing this. Constantine, we have to give uh, Jaime that uh, <laughs> needs to be able to share a screen. I don't know. Okay. Okay, it's done. He should be able to do it now. Thank you so much. Uh, let me try now. Mm -hmm. so. Share. Do you see my screen now? Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm, I'm really happy to be here tonight. Um, this is going to be maybe uh, just an overview of something that would be a, a research of a lifetime. And um, well, uh, hold on, there we go. Um, well, the first time I, I, I heard of, about Alexander Costello, it was back, it's almost 20 years ago. It was back in, in, in May 25th, 2002. And that was when I interviewed uh, Jerry Gulota. Um, I asked him about his, his formative years at Pratt um, Institute, and he talked about people I never heard of, except Eva Seisel. Uh, she was really famous for me at that time. But um, he was really, really, really enthusiastic about uh, uh, telling me about Alexander Costello, Rowena Reed Costello, and some other people. So uh, I was, I was intrigued because most of us here in, in, in Latin America, we believe uh, that um, we are sort of uh, indebted to the Bauhaus pedagogy. And it was like, uh, who are these people? I don't know. So I started doing my homework and um, I found these two books referencing exactly just like Tucker said a few minutes ago, who, who uh, was uh, Alexander. And then that's a picture of, of uh, Arthur Poulos who wrote this book, The American Design Adventure. And um, sh shortly after I, um, Jerry Gulota sent me uh, um, this book of elements of design and that's when I clicked. And, I, I, and that was something I, I, was, I was really looking for some answers. So it was kind of a personal quest. And yes, quoting Pulos from this book, I, I also take that note uh, from page nine, uh, 165. So yes, Alexander was considered by many to have been the father of industrial design and education. So a practicing artist and designer, he developed a philosophy, a form that brought uh, the rational into balance with the aesthetic. So that was Pulos' words. So let's go back a little bit further. We know that he was born in Persia in Ispahan. That's the place uh, in 1896. And um, he spent some time with his mom in, in France. Uh, she, he lived in Paris and he was learning languages. He learned um, Persian, French and Arabic. And um, after a while he was also learning German because he wanted to study philology at the University of Berlin. And um, unfortunately, we were uh, put under deten in detention and um, invited to enroll in the army. But um, as Alexander did, decided to escape. I'm sorry, I think I have a terrible internet connection. So he fled Germany, like many others did, and he traveled to New York. And this is perhaps the New York he, he first saw from that ship, uh, but in color. first presented himself to the so um, he could avoid deportation back to Germany, his embassy, the Persian embassy at that time. So after a while, he decided to pursue um, an art career. Um, so he studied at the National Academy of Design, and he also um, attended other schools such as the Art Students League. 
Now, um, let me let me. I'm, I'm using this this scheme, this diagram that perhaps most of us are, are really aware of or acquainted with. It was designed by Alfred Bohr in 1936, and um, here uh, these two lines uh, are separating, so to say, the Alexander that arrived in 1916 to New York, and the second line is the um, the mature. Um, artist who was developing his own aesthetic ideas based on what he learned in the Americas. So um, we have to keep in mind that um, many American and European artists were traveling back and forth to Europe and, and the United States. So most of them might have seen not just Cubism or suprematism or futurism or whatever, but they, they could also have been um, uh, at least getting acquainted with uh, neoplasticism, the still, uh, and naturally the Bauhaus, but as well as surrealism and, and other art or abstract art movements. So this was an, an interesting um, era to live in because you had lots of information and input from different um, approaches and ideas. Um, from this era, um, he met ba uh, Baklav Bitlachil, um, he was um, and an one of the um, at that time he was a, a promoter and advocate of abstract art, and uh, he they became friends. They exchanged um, uh, letters and so on. Um, so this was really a very interesting and nurturing environment uh, to develop uh, different art forms. So this gave him his own vision of what uh, could be pictorial art. So uh, in 1921, um, around 1921, he, he, was, he became a, an art teacher at the Kansas City Art Institute. And that's where he met Rowena Reed. And uh, I think they married in 1922. And um, by 1929, they moved to the uh, Pittsburgh area where he, uh, he had the opportunity to work as a practicing painter and a, an art teacher at uh, the Carnegie Institute of Technology. Today, that is Carnegie Mellon, as we can see. So um, he started discussing his own ideas with several um, colleagues and it was mostly about composition in, in painting. Uh, one of his colleagues was Ross Moffat to whom he addressed a, a letter describing his theory which he called the theory of plastic recession. So um, there's another interesting thing a fact about Ross Moffat because he was also he attended classes at Art Students League in in New York in 1914 so that's more or less uh, the references we have. So um, this is these are just a few excerpts of, uh, from this letter. You can see the letterhead of Carnegie Institute of Technology. And um, from the beginning, um, he started explaining all this language he had been developing uh, through the years. So um, in his explanatory letter, he addresses the importance of what he called the fundamental medium of any art composition, that space, and he, he, it could be either negative or positive. So um, to begin with, uh, the canvas should be considered not as a flat surface, but rather a cube, a world in its own. So where all forms, which are the, is the positive space, are enveloped in the negative space. So um, in this environment, each form has a capability of moving backward, forward from the surface of the picture and rotating on its axes and so, so forth. Just like this. So um, he made several sketches along his this letter explaining what um, could be achieved uh, in terms of how you place an object, how, how the surface is positioned uh, in reference to another and so forth. And you can achieve all these, um, a variety of um, compositions. 
as you can see here. So throughout his letter, he illustrates uh, all his concepts with on this kind of diagram using different resources, uh, establishing different dynamics between the elements, their position in space and related to each other, as well as their interactions with negative space. And the key here is that negative space is not just a static void between elements, but rather an important active asset for the artist. So here we see a, little, a few more diagrams uh, in which you can see different cases. In figure one, you can see that uh, they are rather static. And figure two, he starts moving all these elements uh, to give some um, interesting idea of composition. And finally, the, the third diagram, the third figure establishes a total dynamic. So concluding the letter, um, he, cost, he mentioned that he had already discussed this theory with um, another colleague, uh, colleague that was Blontheim. We suspect it's Adolf Blontheim from New Hope, but he points out that uh, Mr. Blontheim, quote, seemed fairly interested. Unlike dynamic symmetry, it won't mechanize the surface of the canvas, but would liberate color and design as color becomes essential to form building. Sorry, I, I'm quoting something, but I skipped one line. Um, so he clo I closed the quote, he seemed just fell interested and he was mentioning rather that they ne needed feeling to make a, a, a work of art. And this way, Costello is sort of uh, rejecting um, symmetry. So we don't know which was, um, or if Ross Moffat responded to this letter or he dismissed it, we don't know that. But um, Alexander's ideas and visual concepts drew the attention of somebody else. This somebody else in 1934 was Donald Donor. So uh, Donald Donor was the head of industrial design department at Carnegie Institute of Technology. So this program began in May 4th, 1934. Um, and he had been working on the curriculum um, because he had some experience in industry and with, um, with his work at Westinghouse Electric Corporation. So um, donor invited members of, of uh, the existing um, Department of Painting and Design at the College of Fine Arts, where Alexander was, was a teacher. And um, uh, those who were willing to implement such a program, they joined in. So he, Alexander became interested in the new discipline, but although he had not gained experience in the field, I mean, yet, he found a way to put his aesthetic ideas into a new practice of art, a new form of art, which is industrial design. So. He joined the industrial design program and became a founding member. Now, uh, Arthur Poulos at that time became one of his students. And this is a testimonial that I found in, in, um, in this interview from, with Robert Brown. And he, as you can read that, let me quote it for everybody. And so he gave us a broad range of experience from constructivistic things to form manipulation to textural problems to a lot of things which broke almost completely with the traditional decorative arts movement. Now, whether it was in the air and everybody was doing it or whether he invented it, I don't know. Well, the thing is that um, Poulos was just his, um, his student, Alexander was his mentor, but um, maybe Poulos ignored all of this, uh, which I just showed you. Um, by 1939, Alexander was uh, an active member of the American Society for Aesthetics, where um, he helped to organize the first two congresses. Um, unfortunately, I uh, haven't found any uh, evidence of her, his participation as a speaker in, in these two events, but I'm, I'm, I suspect he did something, but I don't have the evidence yet. And as I mentioned, this is work in progress. Um, in 1934, I mean, 44, I'm sorry. Um, he was uh, commissioned to develop this um, educational prototype of industrial design. Um, it was with um, 
Donald Doner and with Laszlo Moholinaj. Um, that Laszlo, I think we, we all know who, who we're referring to. And um, they also had some input from uh, John Bassos, uh, Ben Nash, and George Kosmak. So uh, despite it wasn't implemented, it served as a model to follow because it, it was, it, it was um, equilibrium with topics, uh, with different topics at that time. And by 1954, Alexander Costello was involved in this project from the, this, was, this is the kitchen of the future from Frigidaire. He was, as a, uh, he was participating as a consultant. Unfortunately, at that time, um, perhaps this is the project that um, stressed him and um, he had this heart attack and um, he passed away. But uh, his legacy lives on. And um, I would like to mention something here that um, uh, we, we know these uh, important designers that were part of the uh, um, prototype of the IDSA, that's uh, Walter Dorwin Teig, uh, Harold Van Doren, and John Buzzer, they all also attended the Art Students League. So who knows, they might have met at some point there. Uh, we don't know that, but that's an interesting speculation I just wanted to, to say. Now, Castello's legacy um, lives beyond um, Pratt Institute or the borders of uh, the United States. Um, this, this is an example of uh, Lance Wyman's work, who is also uh, Pratt alumni. And he worked on the um, 1968 Olympics. Uh, I don't know if I should really call this a corporate image, but I would rather call it the uh, system of uh, signaling uh, of the event. It was something unique at that time. It was really colorful. And the program just um, was a marvelous experience. And Castello's heritage also lives on through uh, Jerry Golota. Um, he organized these two courses, uh, one for, for Portugal and the other one for my, the foundation of my own school. So um, his ideas have been living through everybody, every one of us who have at least had some uh, contact with this marvelous course that was also uh, taken a little bit further with Rowena Reed. So um, this is my closing, and I thank you uh, for listening for my present uh, this presentation. Thank you, Jaime. That was really uh, great. I love the way you squeezed all that together into uh, uh, a short presentation, and I think you uh, pretty much captured the you know, captured a lot of the things that uh, Alexander was into. But one of the things that we uh, Pratt people forget is the, is the fact that uh, Alexander was an artist and that he, um, in fact, had to support himself um, painting um, also while he was developing the program. And so, that's a seg that's supposed to be a segue into our next speaker, who is um, I, the uh, curator person, and she, um, Rachel uh, Clippus, she's um, from Pittsburgh, and so I think that, that might be why she um, um, got interested in Costello. But she, um, uh, I heard about her, um, and. At the same time, she um, she told me about an exhibit that she was curating about um, Serbian um, uh, the, the art of Serbian women in the Bronx, and so it's called um, Among Women, and it's even more relevant uh, lately because of uh, things that have been happening in world politics. But anyway, Rachel. Um, Rachel, why don't you tell us your, your side of the story? Hi, thanks Tucker. Thank you all for being here. Jaime, thank you for your great presentation. Tucker, thank you for organizing this event. Um, when I was an art history student, 
I fell in love with murals from the Great Depression, New Deal murals. And I found out about Alexander because I started going around Pittsburgh, looking at all the murals and all of the post offices. And there were two in particular that I fell in love with and Alexander happened to be involved with it. And also another mural in Somerset County, which is about an hour from Pittsburgh. But my presentation is really focusing on the two in Jeanette's and I'm going to share my screen and get this started. Can we all see this? Yep. Cool. Yep. Let me just make an adjustment here. Make it a little bigger. Hold on. Okay. So in 1938, the Treasury Section of Fine Arts, a federal agency responsible for the resurgence of mural painting in the United States, under Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal, commissioned two murals for the Jeanette, Pennsylvania Post Office. And at first glance, these murals might seem to be highly typical from that time period. However, these works also illustrate a unique aspect of mural production at that time. So the murals that I'm going to talk about are these two. On the left, we have glass industry, and on the right, we have the Battle of Bushy Run. And I have conducted research at the National Archives in College Park, Maryland, and at Carnegie Mellon University. And these murals are unique because they contradict New Deal scholarship in that one, these are a collaboration and they are not the hand of a single artist. They also suggest that the artist determined the final content, which was not usual during that time period, and that this artistic vision reveals a decidedly modernist approach to the murals and what some have seen as the section's efforts to have an anti-modernist and anti-radical agenda, but under Costello's vision, he was able to sneakily put some things into these murals to suggest otherwise. So after a long period of neglect, over the past 30 years, there have been scholars such as Carol Ann Marling, Marlene Park, and Gerald Markovitz who have brought much attention to the role of art in the New Deal programs. These scholars really highlight the resurgence of mural painting at that time under the, the treasury section of fine arts, which was commonly known as the section. And what I'm talking specifically about are murals that were made for federal courthouses and post offices and post offices. So this is a very specific branch of what I'm talking about. And they commissioned thousands of murals like this across the United States. So they were made to help put artists back to work, but also to raise the morale of the American people and create some kind of identity for communities across the United States. And also I wanna to highlight too, that these had a very specific agenda. At the time during the Great Depression, people were questioning American values, capitalism, and many other things. And these murals were really intended to reinforce that. So while they might be seen as prosaic or idealized visions of America um, and done in a very representational form, they tried to stress economic and social progress. So to give you an example, we have Harry Sternberg's mural from Ambler, Pennsylvania. And we have a scene of industry on the left. We have a, an abundant farm on the right. And it's suggesting that hard work and familial activities will thrust the nation out of this economic failure and into a successful future. And Sternberg actually said of this, of this mural that this is a picture of promise as it will be under our developing and progressive democracy. The, the section though was also very critical of people and what they painted. And you could not just paint whatever you want. It had to go under a revision, uh, a very detailed revision process with them. And it was very rigid and very uniform according to some scholars. And it started to become known as painting section it was very heavy handed. And for instance, in this one, the section had an issue with the horse's tails in Georgina Clitgard's 
mural for Goshen, New York. And in Jared French's mealtime with early coal miners, they had an issue with the squashes. They thought they were too suggestive. And that these criticisms, they weren't just criticisms, they were mandates. If they made this, this critique, you were expected to change it. So many of these artists were forced to change the images. And in Carol Ann Marling's book, Guatemala America, she argues that Edward Rowan was at the root of this system and that he had designed something to weed out Mexican partisans, this is a quote, uh, Mexican partisans, abstractionists, academics, and other extremists. And the last mural we saw, the husband of Georgina, Clash uh, Clithgard, called Rowan and his associates little swarm Hitlers that painted the picture for you in Washington. So this criticism, the, the section really discouraged abstract and modernist art. It did not condone violent imagery and minority groups had to be represented in a certain way. So all of these murals, from my perspective, are really about maintaining the status quo and are really contrived snippets of American life. These were not art for art's sake. Now, I'm a public art administrator. I've been one for seven years, and I've started to appreciate a different understanding of these murals um, from my perspective. So public art really has a certain function, and there are certain review processes you have to go through. So what does that mean for Jeanette's? and Alexander Costello. So I bring us back to the murals and the, the beginning process started like all these other murals. There was a call for artists. So in 1935, a call for artists went out and artists were asked to submit sketches for this new post office that was going to be built in Jeanette. And every effort was made to attract local artists to do the work for these post offices and federal courthouses, and usually local professors were involved on the selection panel. So the original winner of this commission was T. Frank Olson, who was a Knight student at the Carnegie Institute of Technology, currently Carnegie Mellon University, and his charcoal sketches won. Unfortunately, he died uh, a few weeks later. He had cancer and he did not tell anyone. So his professor was Alexander Costello, and he wrote to the section, and he said that he wanted the murals to happen for the benefit of his wife, Mrs. Florence Olson. And surprisingly, section officials agreed, and they contracted with Costello to oversee the execution of Olson's designs. And within a few weeks, Costello started the project, and he brought on another assistant, Robert Lepper, who was also a professor at Carnegie Tech to, to help with the project. So what's interesting about these murals is that a New Deal scholarship, uh, Park and Markovitz, who wrote a really well-known book called Democratic Vistas, they attribute these murals to Costello and T. Frank Olson. David Lembeck, who is a contemporary scholar of New Deal murals, uh, who is currently working on his book, The Common Candace, only attributes these to Robert Lepper. However, through my research, what I have found is that Olson made the original sketches, Costello took those sketches, revised the content and the composi compositional design based on his own practice and theories, and then Robert Lepper was responsible for actually painting them because these murals weren't installed until 1938, and by that time, Costello had already left to go to Pratt to work with Donald Donner on the industrial design program. So Robert Lepper was really left um, withholding the bag with these murals. And I could talk about that a little bit later if there's time. So what we're looking at, we have the Battle of Bushy Run here on the right. And in the center, we have Henry, uh, Colonel Henry Bouquet. This is a depiction of Pontiac's rebellion during the French and Indian War in 1763. We have, uh, we have Royal American Redcoats and British Highlanders fighting around Colonel Henry Bouquet. We see Native American soldiers. And up here in the right corner, we have Andrew Byerly, who was a folk hero that took water to the wounded. And over here on the left, we see a more contemporary scene of Jeanette of that time period. If you don't know about Jeanette, Pennsylvania, at one time, 
uh, in the early 20th century, they were producing 80% of the world's glass. And they were also known for, for rubber production and making tires. Uh, Jeanette, unfortunately, does not have that uh, capacity now. It has changed greatly. But at that time, you see glass production happening in the top. You see an ode to rubber production on the bottom. In this upper right-hand corner, we see a scene of Jeanette. It's a contemporary skyline from the 1930s. And over here in this left corner, we see Henry Sellers McKee with his arms crossed. He's the founder of Jeanette and President Grover Cleveland. So this is what we're looking at in, this, in, this, in these two murals. And what's really interesting about this is that in my reading of the letters between Costello and the section, because Robert Leffer did not correspond with them, it was only Costello. Costello made all these suggestions. You know, he wanted to make sure that the murals mimicked each other. He also said that Olson's designs needed to be reworked because the industrial processes weren't represented correctly. And the exchange was very collegial. And the section had no doubt whatsoever of Costello's ability. They did not question him on anything. And they actually, in this letter, they say, the changes are a great improvement over the original. And I congratulate you on having achieved a panel full of figures and yet giving no indication of overcrowding. So this is very, this is a very interesting exchange. So what did Costello do? So on the left hand side, this is Olson's original design. And on the right hand side, we have the murals as they stand today in Jeanette. So as I said, Costello wanted the murals to mimic one another, but the changes that he makes are subtle and start to give a different suggest, a different reading of what's going on. And I can take us through these a little bit closer. So in the original mural, Olson has Henry Sellers McKee in the top left corner. And he's looking very confident. He's looking over Jeanette and these industrial processes. And he looks like a robber baron industrialist who is like, look at what I have done. However, in Costello's revision, we see Henry Sellers McKee here a bit more subdued, a bit more pensive, and he's standing with Grover Cleveland. And I know who these figures are because Robert Lepper wrote a short article for a Jeanette newspaper um, describing who everybody was. And this reading suggests something a little bit different because the positioning of the founding of the, of the founder of Jeanette um, is really calling into question the role of robber baron capitalists. And this positioning with Grover Cleveland is significant because Grover Cleveland was the president during another uh, American depression in the 18, in the late 1800s. And he did absolutely nothing to help the American people. He believed the government should not be involved in anything like that. And he felt like it weakened national character. So this is a complete, something completely opposite than what uh, FDR was doing at the time. So this is starting to question a little bit the, the New Deal politics and the message that the section wanted to send. Another interesting change they made was that here we have Henry Sellers McKee in Olson's original sketch pointing to uh, an old skyline of Jeanette based on his founding. And we have a crowd scene of men and women, but on the right, we have something different. So Costello revised this to a, a more modern skyline of Jeanette. He removes the women from the crowd and now he puts a man behind a podium raising his fist. Uh, evoking images of labor strikes and union protests at that time. So as Marling's earlier quote pointed out, um, these themes were avoided by section murals, but labor issues were rampant in, in industrialized areas like Southwestern Pennsylvania at the time, because many people were looking at socialism and the Soviet Union for answers to America's collapsed economy. And Costello would have known that because he would go to the plants. He was involved in helping uh, do industrial design, obviously. So he was very well aware of this. So we have these two vignettes that change and it's 
putting the laborers against the capitalists, the robber baron, uh, robber barons, capitalists, and, and the government as well. So a very interesting change. Um, another striking revision is this rubber tapper in the lower left corner of Olson's original sketch. And if you don't know anything about the rubber making process, um, rubber tappers worked on rubber plantations outside of the United States at the time, which were usually founded by people like Henry Ford. And a lot of these places were in Africa. So they would collect the rubber from the rubber tree in pails. And it was uh, a tedious process. So in Olson's original sketch, this man is more integrated into the scene. But in Costello's redesign, this, this rubber tapper is very out of place. And he's sort of trapped between the sheet glass machine and a pail here in the lower corner. And there wasn't much written, there's actually nothing written specifically about the rubber tapper other than Robert Lepper saying that it is a rubber tapper. It suggests that, you know, in my, in my interpretation that this figure refers to the racial inequality in many American plants and the racial tensions in southwestern Pennsylvania, which again, Costello and Lepper would have been aware of. So why, why was Costello making some of these changes? So these, these revisions that he made were coming directly out of his own personal theories on art and painting. And the letter that Jaime found from the Ross Moffat papers actually helped me to realize that these lecture notes that I found at Carnegie Mellon, that these really are Costello's thoughts because these notes I found in Robert Lepper's papers. So at the time, it was really hard for me to know, was Costello, was this some sort of collaborative thinking? But it's not. Um, based on the letter that Jaime shared with me. So that's really significant. But what Costello wanted to do or what he was teaching at that time was that paintings should have a middle point. And we see two middle points in the Battle of Bush, Iran and glass industry with Colonel Henry Bouquet and, and the glass worker. And that there need to be these certain forces that, that revolve around the middle point that provide balance. So Costello exhorted, and you can see from these notes that art should balance economic, social and political forces as well as visual elements. So for glass industry, the vignettes around the focal point in Olson's depict McKee as leader and founder balanced by the rubber tapper in the scene below. And then in the final version um, by Costello, we have, we have a different type of balance with Henry Sellers McKee with Grover Cleveland, with the images that evoke uh, labor struggle and a more isolated rubber tapper. So instead of what we see with Harry Sternberg about what will move America out of this, in Costello's version, we get a sense of a figure eight that we are sort of trapped between these things that are happening without any solution which was very contradictory to what people, or I should say what the section wanted for these murals. We also see that Costello's writing and art production has a strong indebtedness to modern art, such as cubism. And in these lecture notes, Costello stated that um, space is the artist's medium. And I quote that, therefore the artist needed to, and I quote, think of volume as single planes. So he theorized that overlapping planes affected an artist's use of space and that line was crucial to how planes develop. So to cultivate this movement, he discouraged parallel lines, citing them as, and I quote, monotonous. And we really get a sense of this in the Battle of Bushy Run, where the muskets of the colonists become more sharply angled. And we start to see where he's playing with these lines. So, and this is very different than Olson's. So uh, these repeatedly shifting angles of the muskets further emphasizes or enhances the cyclical compositional framework that I talked about earlier and is really going with where Costello is going in the future. And 
And also another thing that Costello talks about in his notes is that things, and I quote, uh, things and pictures don't converge on the horizon. So the Jeanette murals don't possess a singular horizon line. And to help unify the work, Costello claimed that line provided rhythm and that this rhythm should be able to go in and out and over. So this statement shows the artist's understanding and appreciation for modernist art. Uh, this line is called the line of continuation. That is how he termed it. And we get a sense of this with the smoke, the rhythm that it creates in glass industry, and also the local foliage and the feeling that we get with this line that it creates throughout the Battle of Bushy Run. So his alterations to both murals grew out of modernist conceptions of space and hint at rad radical politics of the day. Uh, the free reign that Costello was afforded uh, really, I don't want to say throws a wrench into New Deal scholarship, but it gives us a different perspective of what some people were able to get away with or be able to do. And one thing that what I appreciate so much about Jaime in, in working on these murals is that for a long time, it was really difficult for me to think about what does this all mean? But what I've started to understand in our, through our discussions is that what he was doing in paintings like this is working out what eventually would become the industrial design program and some of his thoughts and theories. So his paintings were helping him to work through that. And it also pushed the boundaries of, of New Deal murals at that time. And that is where I will end. And I apologize for my wonky uh, slide, but I either win with Zoom or I don't. But I thank you all so much for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. That was uh, really, um, really interesting. I think it's, uh, it's always great to hear someone analyze uh, art and design and dig down into things that you don't, that I, I don't notice right away. So thank you very much. Does, um, we thought we'd have, you know, we wanted to have time in tonight to have other people's recollections or memories of Alexander or add comments to this, um, to this, because I think it's really great to um, sort of fill out who, who the man was and what his impact was. So does anybody have any uh, questions or comments? Jeff, I think you're gonna, yeah. Hi, <clears throat> so um, th this is so interesting and thank you. These presentations are really invaluable and they should be brought into the Pratt archives. They're really important for us to understand what we're teaching then and now. What we're teaching now is very much what we taught, what was we were learning then. One thing I just want to bring to everyone's attention, what Alexander understood in terms of abstraction was more than just composite of organizational skills. It was a realignment of the brain. And what we need to understand is that when, and that we understand this as educators, Karen and everyone else who's teaching now 3D can attest to this, that you can bring these principles forward. And I might, I might advise everyone to get a copy of the terms of abstraction and 3D representation that Catherine and others have brought and have, have published because they're beautiful and they're really important because they bring um, an objective viewpoint of how to, terminize this. But what's more important is that it takes time to teach this, not just in terms of the visual principles, but the brain has to change. And what we're now learning from other uh, scientific disciplines is that when we teach this idea, it takes time for the brain to reconfigure itself, to become attuned to these principles and see them. We don't always see them at first. We think we see them, but we don't. And as educators, we undertake time. And while we have to leave Pratt, they will continue, if they're interested, in absorbing these and reorganizing their brain to begin to see more and more. Believe me, I've been out of Pratt for a long time, and I'm still learning. That's all I have to say. 
Can I say something? Yes. Uh, my, name, my name is Lewis Nelson. I, I have to say this. I mean, I'm looking through at everybody looking back at me, which is kind of interesting in a certain way. But uh, I think of all the people here, I may be the eldest. And in a certain way, that only says that I was probably had the opportunity to see one of the most original pieces of work of Alexander Costello, which was the big mural that he had in Student Union Building at Pratt Institute in 1954, because that's when I was um, a freshman at Pratt. And uh, some of those things that you all were pointing out in the organization of those early murals were indicative in, in that particular mural, which was an indication of really human form, but human form in dynamic forms. And you could see all the lines, whether they're lines or whatever you want to call them, lines of continuations and so forth, were actually the methodology of the, of the teaching of two-dimensional design at Pratt at that time, which probably was before 1954. And it was the same principles that were in the teaching of three-dimensional design because they were just merged together. And that was the nature of the Costello's organization of education of design at, at that particular time. And that you see continuities of it going on today in somewhat way. And I think a lot of people would say that it's falling apart in some ways, but it, it went back there. And, and the analysis that he had made of Alexander, that Alexander Costello made with the, with, with the developmental help of all his colleagues from Carnegie Mellon, through Pratt, uh, and through the, some of those names of people that I know little of, and then I knew a lot of, probably never met. And I never met Alexander Costello. He died six months before I started at Pratt. Uh, and yet uh, there was never at that period of time, a period of mourning that I could see at Pratt at that time. And everyone just was continuing on in the methodology of what he was teaching. Um, and it was held by everyone. It was held by the Dean of the school all the way through the, the, uh, the, the heads of various departments uh, at Pratt. So there was an integration of the design of, th of two-dimensional design, three-dimensional design, human figures, not in hu uh, inanimate figures, the sense of abstract movements, uh, in three-dimensional form and, and in two-dimensional form that would take you into three-dimensional form was all part of that education way back when. It was all in that. I wish to this day we could find where that mural what went and where it was, <laughs> where it had, had eventually ended up. And I suspect it was, I would fear to say that it was in, um, in the bowels of the deconstruction of uh, of, of the, the hall at that time. Anyway, that's I think the thank you, Lewis. I think the first thing is for you is to go over to Pratt and try and figure out where that wall is, <laughs> and then we can try and see if it's uh, the painting is there or not. But I, you know, your descriptions of like, oh, by the window over around that corner, it's not good enough to for me to find it. So. All right, we'll but, do that, uh, Tucker. You and I will go walk over there one day. Okay, great. So, uh, Lewis, I mean, uh, Sinclair, your hand is up. Yeah. Hi, everybody. It's so nice to see you. I am sorry you can't see me. I'm not getting my camera to work tonight. So, um, those are my initials. And um, here I am. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, Rachel and Jaime, it's really fascinating. And I, as a student of, uh, Pratt ID, I and a, and a teacher of industrial design elsewhere. Um, I loved seeing some of the language in um, Mr. Costello's notes. Um, you know, seeing the, the the axes across the paintings was fascinating. I'd, you know, Rachel, I'd love to know who. Actually, I'm going to ask. So, who made those line drawings? That's question one. But before, I want to get the second question in, in case I don't get it done. So, I'd love to know who made the pencil or ballpoint drawings on the original 
drafts, if those were his uh, analyses of axes. Um, and then the, the next thing is, I just that that one slide you show showed when you were talking about, um, you know, you're articulating his change about the man at the podium and the fist and the labor strikes and um, the West looking to socialism in 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 Russia and, and to try and figure out the economic crash and and how art in that period um, was exploring other values. And then here is this slide that says forces out of balance, forces to balance, where he's listing um, sociological elements that are in conflict or harmony in the frame. But that language to my ears only exists in the balance of directional forces, which is pure abstraction and purely compositional. So it's fascinating to see him, his notes that actually take this language that I learned as only an abstract compositional theory. And he's really applying um, strategy for social change. And I'd love to know from Rachel and maybe, you know, Jaime and anybody else here, like what was that through line? Uh, you know, is there is there other evidence of how perhaps when the the curvilinear problem evolved and when the rectilinear and uh, concavity problems evolved and we started to look at how balance of directional forces um, become expressed in abstract composition, was there other dialogue concurrent about how these things can manifest sort of socially or anthropologically? Full stop. Thank you. Hi, Sinclair. Thank you. So to talk about the ballpoint drawings on Olson's sketches, that was actually me at the time looking at Costello's notes and trying to figure out what it was he was actually doing. Cool. Good job. Thank you. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Although I wish I would have made a copy of that first. <laughs> right. I, just, I, just, I, just so into it, I just started doing it. So every time I show it, I, you know, I just show it as it is. Um, I don't I don't have a clear answer to your second question. I, I have not found any evidence from Costello where he elaborated on that. So I also don't know what his specific politics were at the time. I have met his daughter before, Adele, when she was in Pittsburgh, and I, I did try to ask her this question about her dad, if she knew anything about where he stood in particular, and she didn't, uh, I don't think she did. Um, she said that he didn't really have any politics, I believe, but she was young when he died. So I, I can't give you much on the second question, but maybe Jaime can. Uh, hi. Um... I'm not sure if I, I, I'm, I'm capable of really answering the second question, but um, um, I, um, when I was reading Arthur Pulo's interview uh, from the Robert Brown uh, archives, those are dead Smithsonian, I found out that he, he could really establish the difference between um, the, um, the education, educational program at Pratt and uh, the one he had in, in at Carnegie. And I think, um, I seem to recall that he was, um, he noticed that it was Rowena who introduced uh, the rest of the, uh, the other exercises, especially the one you're mentioning about uh, line in space. And you, you did mention that, right? Uh, I think I rambled ab off about four of them, but yeah, they all oh, yeah. contain sort of, you know, what the 3D ones talk, well, even in the 2D representations talk about balance of directional forces. And so mm -hmm. that one phrase, yeah. So um, in that case, I think we have to attribute that to Rowena. And um, um, she made this, this, this uh, course to evolve uh, a bit far beyond what I think Alexander was, was expecting. The language is conspicuous. Yes, indeed. But but you can still see that it was kind of um, an original idea from Alexander, but um, indeed Rowena just made that thing flourish in, in different directions. Right. Really. Thank you so much. Oh, really thank is. you. Great. Uh, are there any other questions or comments? 
Tucker, I just thought that this was a terrific uh, session. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And just thank you for, for getting everybody together to do it. Rita's got her hand up. Thank you everybody for doing it. Yeah. Rita Sue's got her hand up. I just want to make one point about Rowena having taken her for four years after I left Pratt. There's a difference between beginning to understand the principle and the concept and articulating it so that everyone can understand. And that's where Rowena stepped in. She developed the vocabulary. She developed the, the principles. She developed the very understandings for, for us to teach. And um, that's special. Yeah. Okay, Rita Sue, you can turn on your mic now. Oh, no. It's not on. It took her a long time to figure out how to turn it off. So, oh, there you go. Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to point out, and I, I don't mean this to be something that makes us our mood of enjoyment here worse, but Mr. Poulos did not believe that females should be industrial design students. He also insisted that his wife walk behind him at least five feet. And I just want to say that on the day that we're supposed to be uh, eulogizing women, that this is not a good thing. And I cannot stand when anybody quotes him because I don't believe a word out of his mouth. Hear, hear. Yeah, well, I don't believe that Costello was the father of industrial design anyway. And I think that the reason why Poulos favored him so much is because he actually had um, Costello for a teacher and the donor had left already and moved to um, Pratt while, um, while Poulos was a student. So, but I would like to say one thing in women's favor that I found out the other day that um, that a, a shaker woman invented the circular saw. And I thought <laughs> that was such a great, a great thing. It's such a like masculine butch thing that the table saw and it was created by a shaker woman. That's great. I, I just wanna say, so taking classes from Rowena, Ro Rowena was multidimensional. She was neither gender. She basically occupied both worlds and handled them very competently. Yes. I agree. Um, Rachel, are there women in those two panels that you showed us left and right in Costello's panels? Are you able to screen share again? Because I was interested to notice that the the surfaces of the bodies of indigenous people were much smoother than those of the aggressors. And I thought it was interesting that Costello used stressed surface qualities to indicate aggressors and smoother surfaces to indicate victims. And I wondered if there's a gender component to it also. Um, there are no women in any of these murals. Uh, Olson did have women in this scene above in this upper right hand image of glass industry, like I said earlier but they were removed only because I think that they were hinting at something else at that time. And I, I never noticed that, um, Sinclair. What I will say is that the people of Jeanette were very familiar with Olson's original sketches and they actually did not like these murals when they were, when they were put up. They actually liked Olson's designs better and what's strange is that these bayonets on the muskets are almost translucent, mm. uh, which was also an interesting change because people wanted to see more of the battle of the blood and guts of it as Olson depicted it. But these sort of transparent bayonets, and it might be hard to see in this, I'm not sure if that was something that Costello wanted or if Robert Lepper decided to do on his own. Um, because like I said, at that time, he was already gone and Lepper was left to paint these. So Lepper may have made choices in how he painted them. Um, in Robert Lepper's papers, he does not reference these murals at all. They're not listed on his resume from 1972, which was a resume that was in the archive. And the only thing I found of these murals in, in his archive at Carnegie Mellon were just two little black and white photos of each mural. 
So I, I, I appreciate the comment. It's something that I could add, although I, I can't really speak to it conclusively. Where are we historically in relation to Grant Wood, if I can ask? It would be at that same time. And any thoughts on why the family's sitting on a checkerboard in the earlier panel? Or a chessboard? What do you mean? Isn't the family picnicking on a chessboard? Yes. Yes, they are on a chessboard. Or mm. actually, it might be a blanket. It looks like a blanket, like picnicking. Mm. So again, these murals, Amer what were American values at the time? Hard work you know, familial values, the family, um, things that underscored the capitalist system, things that Americans or the government wanted to provoke. So they did not want to disrupt the status quo. And everything in a mural like Harry Sternberg's reinforced that. And I think Jaime has a comment. Oh yes, I just wanted to apologize for for quoting somebody who was so so terrible with women. I ignored <laughs> that, so um, I'm sorry, really. Okay. And especially on this day, so uh, right. so I feel like uh, you know we have this saying in, in in Mexico, like a goat in in a in a crystal shop. You can imagine. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. The um, I also would like to point out that. Um, leper was um uh stayed he was he he wanted to be one of the founders of the industrial design profession and he played that up and in his long life at carnegie carnegie mellon that he was what he played up the fact that he was one of the first um teachers of industrial design who kept on working at carnegie tech after donor and the Costello's left. Mm. So Jaime, put your hand down. Thank you. <laughs> Does anyone have any more questions or comments? I would just I, like to see more of Alexander's paintings if they if these photographs exist somewhere. Yeah, me too. Why don't um, I think um, Rachel has some more in her collection so maybe we can organize another event and um and see some more pictures yeah or hold if on. she has them right handy hold on rowena had one in her studio yes and i don't know what happened to that but it was a beautiful painting figurative painting that he had done abstracted and uh, the last time i saw it was when i last left rowena's loft mm -hmm. yep i have one more question Rachel, are you able to pull up that those panels again? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Here, so, let's see, wait, let's see if I can make, let's do it like this. Uh, wait, now I can't do it, hold on. Wait, I'm gonna try to make it bigger. No, nope, that doesn't work. That's bigger. This Wait, is, you this see, is, you this is great. Thing? This is great. So my question is, it was really interesting to see you point out how the axes and the directional forces of the glass blowing and the muskets and things changed. It Given the sort of balance of activity generally and the density of activity, I'm curious to know why this tree or this shrubbery on the far right is getting so much action. Is it possible he was asked to paint over something? It seems conspicuous to me that we this all this greenery would get so much screen time yeah. when well, everything is so dense with people and activity and narrative. Well, let's and someone's back. been painted over too. Well, if we look. So oh, I'm look bringing, at that! Yeah, I'm bringing up the original sketch again, and. I, I can't answer that for certain Sinclair, but I mean, as a group here, we could look at both and maybe think about why that might have been done. I mean, for me, they they take out some of the violence in the, in this painting, they kind of play it down a little bit, especially with the transparent muskets. 
Uh, if you saw this mural in real life, you would see how transparent those muskets are. It looks like they don't even penetrate the Native Americans. It looks wow. like it's just like, uh, like it's like invisible. It's very strange. It is really strange. And I don't have a concrete answer, but again, here's the original sketch and the final sketch. Mm -hmm. The right, foliage, there, there's the I tree mean, for sure. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the foliage to me, uh, I mean, it doesn't look like local foliage. It's it's a little bit different, but, you know, happy to hear anything that all of you think about what's going on here. So I appreciate the question. It seems to me that, that some of these things would have been part of the actual, there's like the basic composition and stuff. And then there's the actual painting that um, Lipper did. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, you know, it's like you like when you watch those guys do, um, demonstrate painting on TV where they make use a sponge and make the trees, you know, I think there's some of some of that kind of technique, like um, sometimes overpowers like what the composition was or what the you know what I mean? Because those trees look completely different than the than the sketch. Yeah. So maybe the guy, maybe the leper's like, I don't know how to draw that kind of tree. I'll draw <laughs> this kind, you know? So I, I will say that, again, this sketch is Olson's. I never, there, there is no documentation of what Costello submitted to the section. So all I have access to is this original sketch from Olson and then the final mural. So the in-between there is no remaining documentation of that. So if, if that existed, we probably would be able to answer these questions. And again, I don't know what stylistic choices Lepper took as Tucker is suggesting because there is no evidence left mm. of that either. So, so did the, do you think the, um, the, the WPA or whatever the, the, um, that group had files that they kept somewhere or they do. is there so this group, so the Treasury Section of Fine Arts that did the murals for post offices and courthouses is one of the best of all the WPA programs because it was so specific. And I've accessed this whole file. I was in College Park. I have the whole file. I have the whole file on Somerset. There isn't anything else. Um, it's very organized. And like I said, there was there were a few things in Lepers, well, not a few things, just those two photos from Lepers files and then everything else I got from the National Archives in College Park, Maryland. So mm -hmm. this is this is what we have. I, I, wonder, I wonder if uh, if you look at some of the, if any of the work that you might have of Alexander's next stage uh, before he got so deeply into industrial design and look at, at, at the two dimensional lines that happen in his composition and compare it back to the, those other sketches. You can just see how, where there may have been growth. Hmm. Thank you. Let's try and find that mural at Pratt. Right, you and I both. <laughs> that would be great, really. There must be some photographs of it, like, or at least in the background, right? Let's find mm -hmm. somebody with the original drawings from that period of time and, um, We'll try to trace it. I, I, I do that with you. The mural is probably down by the swimming pool, wherever that is. <laughs> yeah. The swimming pool is now the student union. All right. We got to get Lewis over there with, with his Sherlock Holmes detective magnifying glass and find the place. So unless there's any more questions or comments, I want to thank Jaime and Rachel, for a great evening, and um, I look Thank forward you so much. to more, um, more of these kinds of yeah. uh, history kind of uh, sessions. It's wonderful. So thank, thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. And we recorded this, so we're going to be able to uh, put it somewhere. Okay, great. Cool. I don't know, in our archive Bye, or Jeff. something. Great. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.
Bye, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye, Gail. Bye, everyone. That was wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 -bye. Trying to read the chat before they all disappear. Why? Well, I, I guess I have to be the last one to log out. Thanks, Constantine. Yeah, I'm still here. <laughs> so I don't know. Do we I have know. to? Can do you have to save the recording, or I don't know how does that work? Do you know, Joe? Ah. Uh... Recording this, uh, yes, I think it will be available, sure. Okay. It's already been recorded, so no problem. Yeah, that was a good part. Usually we yes. remember at the end to record it. Uh -huh. Thank you, Tucker. Thank you so much. Thanks. I'm good. Uh-oh, so, getting a call from Lewis. So I'll see you guys. Okay. Should I leave Lewis, you here or end the meeting? <laughs>